Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. All right, I'll invite anyone that might still be in the lobby to come on in. We're going to get started here. And if you're listening in on FM radio, good morning to you. And if you're catching this a little bit later when he posts online, hello to you as well. I'm glad that we're able to come together to worship the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. I hope you had a lovely Thanksgiving. I know I um, there's a part of me that doesn't want to look at a pie again, <laughs> but there's another hungrier part of me that will absolutely still eat any pie that's put in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the duplicity of man. <laughs> But I invite everyone to stand. I'll give us an opening prayer, and we'll get into a time of worship this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, holy is your name, Lord. There is none like you. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. You reign above all. You created this world, this universe that we live in. You created us in your own image, to have relationship with you, to praise you, to walk with you, to love you. Lord, thank you so much for creating us, for sustaining us day by day. God, we know that we, as fallen humans, make choices and sin against you. None of us in this room has never sinned. But God, through your great love for us, you sent your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross as a perfect offering for sin, a blameless lamb that could fulfill what was required and by his death, we no longer have to die in our sins. Lord, thank you for the gift of your salvation, your free gift. We cannot earn it, but thank you, God, for choosing to give it anyway. Lord, this morning, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would fill us. So that we can give you glory and give you the praise that your name deserves. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.
with thanksgiving and our hearts full of praise. Oh, holy God, we seek your face. We join the angel celebration and serenade you with our songs. Our holy God, the Lord of
Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I invite you to be seated, and now we'll have Ray Breedlove come forward and give us our communion devotion for this morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. Thinking, thinking again this week about the expectations versus what actually happened in the minds of the disciples and actually in the minds of the people overall. Because in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 19, it's when Jesus Christ introduces himself in his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth. It says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, and this is actually from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I know if I was sitting there as a Jew at that point, all I would be thinking is, okay, good news to the poor, Romans are taxing us to death. We need some relief. Freedom for the prisoners, prisoners that Rome had taken. It says to set the oppressed free. Obviously, that means getting rid of Rome. That's what the Messiah would do. He would get rid of all of our oppression. And it must have come as an incredible shock as Jesus progressed through his ministry to hear that for his disciples to hear that he not only wasn't going to drive Rome out, he said that the religious leaders of the Jews, the people who really wanted Rome out, were going to kill him, try him and kill him. The exact opposite of what they wanted from a Messiah, what they expected. And it just reminded me that oppression has a lot of forms. And obviously the Jews were oppressed by Rome. A lot of taxes. The um, Herod actually, this first Herod was pretty good. He built a temple. He tried to keep peace with the Jews. He did quite a bit, but still, you know, they were under the Roman control. 
But God recognized that that wasn't the oppression that was the problem. The oppression of sin was the problem. It was sin that needed fixing, not the Romans. And Jesus coming and announcing that he would set the oppressed free obviously had a totally different message than what the people sitting in front of him probably expected. But Jesus knew that the Romans would come and go. They'd be, you know, at some point they would, they would leave, somebody else would take over. But sin would always be there. And sin is what needed to be conquered. The oppression of sin, the oppression of our selfishness, what breaks our relationship with God, that's what needed to be conquered. That's what we needed to be set free from. And we can be thankful in this situation that God didn't just fix a particular problem at that time and leave us with an eternal problem. He made an eternal fix by going to the cross, offering himself, paying the, the price of sin, so that no matter what oppression happens in the world, we actually have the, the chance to be internally free, no matter what happens outside. As we come and take this bread, as Jesus said, his body broken for us, and the cup that's the new covenant in his blood, realizing that no matter what happens outside, and no matter legitimately terrible it might be, we can be free inside because of God's love and his forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, we do come again. Weekly, probably need to come a lot more. Remember your sacrifice. Remember what you gave. Remember that you took care of the most important thing, our relationship with God. Ask as we come, take this, appreciate it, be thankful for it, and go this week in your freedom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone. But in the costly wounds of love at the cross, my worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the
Christian Fellowship. I love you. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving time. And now getting closer to December, we're into Advent season, looking at great things about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and hope you have an awesome Christmas season. Let's go to God in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of so many blessings you've given to us. And thank you for the time of Thanksgiving that we've had to celebrate all your many benefits to us. Lord, we're now in Advent, looking forward to the coming, the birth, the celebration of Jesus' coming to a manger in a stable in Bethlehem and how God came here to earth. You visited us. Thank you, Lord, for that great story. And Lord, thank you for all the festivities that we use to celebrate that. I pray, Father, our minds would constantly be upon you, that our hearts would find their rest in the story of your love for us. And Lord, always make us a people of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, starting with verse 18. We're in a series here in Advent looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in that order. They're spin on Christmas. So today we're focusing on the book of Matthew. And Matthew is an interesting section because it comes as that one little firewall between the law of the Old Testament and the grace and the mercy in Jesus Christ coming through the New Testament. And there, Matthew chapter 1 is ground zero on the collision of those two. First, let's take a look at it, at, read the text, and then we'll unpack a little bit as to telling us about. Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18, going through, through verse 21. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Matthew is an interesting person. We'll talk about him just a little bit. A rule guy, a law guy. And that's what was coming through the Old Testament up to this point, the Law and the Prophets. There was some grace in there. There was some faith in there. There was some day-to-day -day life stuff in there. Yes, of course. 
but it was primarily known as law and profits. The law being the regulations and the profits being the people who say you're doing a lousy job at keeping the regulations. Thinking back to, back to old uh, Andy Griffith's show, Barney Fife, giving the rules to prisoners in the little jail. I said, now we have, here at The Rock, we only have one rule, and that is obey all rules. What do you do with that? Well, Matthew is the first person that we come across in this. He's the guy who writes it down. And he loves starting his passage, verse 1 after that, we, which we didn't read, as a genealogy. Now, whenever somebody comes to me and asks, how can I learn more about Jesus? Where do I start reading in the New Testament? I never say Matthew because it starts off with a genealogy. Whereas it is pretty overwhelming or boring or whatever to the average reader. For Matthew, this was great stuff because Matthew was used to long lists of names. And after each name was probably one word, either paid or unpaid. That's all that really mattered to him. He was a man who loved lists of names. He loved genealogy. He loved law, Jewish law, Roman law, tax law, community law. He loved it all. Um, he's heard everybody's story. You know, people would want to give a smaller tax and he said that they should. Oh, it's been a rough year on the farm. <sighs> Matthew knew everybody's story. He probably walked past everybody's farm and saw whether it was doing well or not. Or every fishing ve vessel, he was, his office was right there. He could see with his own two eyes what they were offloading and so on. He knew everybody's story in town and how they were doing. And he knew the law. And he enforced the law, the Roman law. And so in this, when he's starting off that genealogy, which we did not cover, it's interesting, he goes on the father line and he just mentions dad, so-and-so begat so-and-so, uh, except for five times he mentions the mamas. And each time is when there's an asterisk associated with that person. The first of them was Tamar, early back in the patriarch's time. Yeah, she, I won't go into the story. Uh, awkward story, her and father-in-law. So that's one. The second one was Rahab, a prostitute during the time of Joshua. And uh, you know, nobody wants a prostitute in the lineage of Jesus. However, without her, they really don't take the promised land very easy, now do they? Then after that, there was a person named Ruth who did absolutely nothing wrong, with the exception of she was a foreigner, and so asterisk after her name. And then after that, there was a lady named Bathsheba who herself, she had an affair with King David. He was the king. She had to do what he said, right? Well, yeah, asterisk there. And then the fifth one is Mary perfection, no problem with her, whatever. But in the public's eye, baby before marriage, asterisk. And in this, Matthew is kind of probably giving an idea here to us in which he's showing all the times where things don't work out as they're supposed to. And yet God's plan, his grace, his mercy, can still find a way to flow through it. That might be an important uh, lesson for, for all of us. Matthew was a stickler for details, a stickler for the law. And he is knowing at this place where law and grace smack up against each other that um, things don't always work out law-wise. Life goes on. Well, the second one that we come across is Joseph. And he's described as being faithful to the law in verse 18, but he's also in love with Mary, who's going to have a baby. It talks about a pledge of marriage here. It was a whole lot more than our version of being engaged, which you can just give the ring back and everything's off, maybe give back the letterman jacket or whatever. But um, not back then. Uh, engagement was the same as marriage. You just hadn't come together yet. And it required a divorce. And in cases of adultery, infidelity, an execution, um, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23 says, yeah, you stoned the person who committed adultery. 
So this is a capital offense that we're having in chapter one of Matthew, according to the law. And so there is Joseph considering divorce. Now, look at this. Mary, premarital pregnant, doesn't look good. Joseph, considering divorce, and of course we in Scripture know God does not like divorce. So this looks bad on all surfaces here. But actually, Mary was being as righteous as a person could be, and Joseph, as a righteous man who loved the law, was doing the best thing he knew righteous-wise. A quiet divorce. You know, everybody else would say, you know, you need to take a public stand against the immorality of adultery before marriage and so on. And um, Joseph is saying, no, I'm not going to take a stand. I love somebody. I don't want any harm to come to them. Let's just keep it quiet. I'll do the right thing, but I am not going for blood on this. Wow. He's being as righteous as he knows. And all of that gives me some a lesson I think we all need, that uh, sometimes we can see things that on the surface look bad. Don't jump to conclusions. Be like a Joseph. Just uh, let's keep things quiet. Uh, if I'm not concerned, I don't need to be making a stand or making a fuss or whatever. Just let it be. Be like Joseph. Seek the creative quietness and uh, don't... Uh, don't uh, make big deals out of things that really oftentimes are not ours to make a big deal of. He loved a woman who was having a baby. Had his hands full enough as is. The third thing we come across is the Holy Spirit's role in the conception. And in this having a little bit being outside the law, outside the bounds of what we as human beings would see from the outside. You know, in many respects, a person could say, the Holy Spirit's taking somebody else's fiance, stealing somebody else's girl. And the Holy Spirit probably look around, well, yeah, wait a minute, what? What's, what's the deal? I, I don't see the problem. He didn't view it as a sexual event anymore, any more than when Jesus would heal a, a blind person that they thought that was surgery. No, it's just God doing God things. There was nothing uh, to, you know, he didn't have to get a burn permit on the day of Pentecost when he put tongues of fire on the apostle's head. It's a different type of thing. He's the creator. He's God. He does what he does, and it's not considered on the human plane uh, whatsoever. You know, when he told Elizabeth, uh, you know, a few months earlier, you're going to have a baby. She was thrilled with the idea. <laughs> it was It was awesome. And so we get the idea here that the Holy Spirit Whenever God comes down to the human level, people don't know what category to put that type of thing in. It might be if you're watching the Hallmark movies, uh, that misunderstanding moment where it makes all the drama come to pass and so on. The thing is, Joseph did not know what on earth the Holy Spirit was doing in this, and he had no category for it. Um, it might be easier if Joseph had been a Greek or a Roman because they always had kind of hybrid creatures. You know, they, uh, you'd have um, uh, a centaur who was like half human, half horse, right? Or Egyptians, they would have uh, uh, the Sphinx, you know, half lion, half human. And there were all sorts of different combinations. The Jews didn't have that hybrid, that combination thing. Joseph did not have a category for this, a protocol or a behavior for this. But the Holy Spirit was there overshadowing everything. We learn from the second verse in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In this case, the Spirit of God is hovering over Mary, Creation, new things are happening outside the protocols and the categories of our mind, of our law, of our expectations. Well, the fourth thing we come across is Jesus, the name of Jesus as deliverer, as savior. See, the Old Testament coming up to the book of Matthew, this train coming this direction, is all law and prophets. Jesus is not the lawgiver. 
And he had some prophetic aspects, I suppose, but he's not known as a prophet. He's the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And the law and the prophets have always been, keep these regulations, that's law. And the prophets, you're doing a lousy job keeping the regulations. And that's what it always has been. Finally, in the history of Israel, during this period, Israel's finally getting its act together. They are, have gotten rid of all the idols. They have been for a couple centuries now, um, yeah, doing the right thing, keeping the regulations, the temple worship and the uh, uh, sacrifices and kosher laws and everything. They've been doing real good on this, you know, <laughs> like an alcoholic who had been dry for a good spell now. It's looking hopeful. That's what has been going on. But they're the exception to the rule, not, well, for instance, the, all the nation of Israel, back in the 700s BC, the top, the, the northern 10 tribes, wiped out by the Assyrians and dispersed. They're gone. And then at the bottom two tribes, you know, in the 500s, you know, 200 years after that, they get taken away to Babylon. They are kept there for 70 years. And after that point, they're told, you all can go back to your homeland now. But actually, only a small minority go. The rest say, you know, we're good in Babylon. The kids are in school. They're in soccer league. We have nice houses right next to the river. We like this place. We'll, we'll do our religion here. We don't need your Jerusalem and temple and all that. So they're kind of outside the norm. And then while the ones that do go back to Jerusalem, a good chunk of them head on down to Alexandria in Egypt. They love that area. It is culture. It is education. And uh, he said, you know, we, we kind of like life down here in Egypt. We don't need Jerusalem and Israel and all that. You know, we're, we, we're good here. And then another kind of dispersion happens from Jerusalem going throughout the Roman Empire. And they'd go to all sorts of capitals. They were trade people. They, they did a great job raising money and living life amongst the Gentiles. And thinking about going back to Jerusalem, they said, you know, we'll come visit sometime. I promise you, we'll come back now and then. But we can do without you. So you see, the ones that were actually in that spot were a small slice of the pie. They were the exception to the rule, but for the most part, the rule could not, the law was not making the difference. It was not lived up to. All that to be said, is that it says in Romans chapter 10, verse four, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. The end of the law. <laughs> for those who believe, not just those who behave, but those who believe. A connection with God. Listen, we all have law. People back then had law, we have law. We have national law, we have local law. We have religious law. We have community law, laws of the house. While you're under uh, uh, my roof, blah, 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 right? Yeah, and, and understandably. Peer law, peer pressure, what's normal for your group, and so on. Lots of expectations all over the place. People are under law in all sorts of matters. Jesus Christ comes to end that and put you in a situation of love. Listen how it says this in Galatians chapter four, verse four. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to, son, to sonship. It's kind of describing being under expectations, under law, as being an orphan in an orphanage. There you are. You're sitting in the institutional table. Up on the law, up on the wall is all the rules of how to have dinner, how to have lunch, how to have breakfast, who cleans what, when, where, and so on. And it's saying that every orphan in that institution wants to be adopted, wants home, wants family. Yeah, there's still going to be expectations and performance and so on, sure. The lists on the wall... The institutional mindset is replaced by sitting on the lap, being read a story, celebrating Christmas around a tree or Thanksgiving around a turkey. They want out of the orphanage of the institution. 
and they want home. Arms of a father, of a mother, holding the child, loving the child into adulthood. That's what it is. The law, the orphanage. Salvation in Jesus Christ. Home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for home. Thank you for Jesus coming to this earth. Blessed be your name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless. Merry Christmas.